Good morning. First of all, thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank, thank you for allowing me to take up some of your time and some of your day to talk about my experiences inside the uh, penal systems of America, to talk about some of the biases that come along with being a felon in America, and to talk about some of the generational curses that we all live with, whether we know it or not. A lot of people believe that incarceration is due to poor decision making on a personal individual's life. I'm here to shed some light on that. Though that's part of the truth, it's not the whole story. But before I get too deep into this, I want to first, some of you people are young, and so you're the minds of tomorrow. You're the future. So you're going to be the ones to make a lot of the changes that are going to be necessary to undo something that's turned into something wrong. Although there's a penalty for everything that you do, if you break the law, you must pay a price. This is true. But incarceration, mass incarceration, has taken on a whole nother form. And only by thinking, only by changes of thinkers, can this system turn around and do what it was meant to do. But before I go any further into that, I want to apologize, first of all, to the younger people in this room. I take a responsibility as an African-American male for perpetuating a lot of the stereotypes, a lot of the angst of American society. It was due to my actions. It was due to the things that I did that changed the mic. <laughs> that allows some of these stereotypes to go forward. I didn't do anything to change it because I was unaware, I was ignorant. There's an old saying that says, if you know better, you'll do better. And so it's with that thought in mind that I go forward and try to shed some light on some things that happened in my life. I, I apologize to you because it was inactivity on my part. It was thoughtlessness on my part and others like me coming behind me that were before me that perpetuated this incarceration scenario that we're trying to de-incarceration. That's what this whole theme is about. So with that said, I want to first uh, show you this book. This book is by a, name, a man named Milton Mickey Moore. Milton Mickey Moore is my uncle. He's a drug kingpin. Uh, you might be more aware of him. There was an adaptation made on the story of his life. Hollywood bought it by uh, a director by the name of uh, Spike Lee, bought my uncle's story, and he turned it into a movie called New Jack City. Some of you might have heard of that movie or seen that movie. That is based on the life story of my uncle, Mickey Moore, who now, this is him in his heyday, this is him on the back here. He's a preacher now, but he just did 25 years in a federal pen. Um, what I want to talk to you about is systemic, systemic incarceration. Incarceration is the United States of America is the only country in the world that incarcerates mass amounts of its population. We outnumber Russia everywhere. We outnumber everywhere. China. No one incarcerates as many of their America of their citizens as the United States of America does. And we are the leading nation in capitalism. We, we run the world, basically. But we incarcerate the majority of our citizens. And a lot of the citizens that make up our incarceration are people of color. That's not, uh, this is not, I don't want to perpetuate a black or white thing. I'm just talking about the facts. People of color make up the percentage, the largest percentage of incarcerated Americans, Americans in the United States. Now, this goes back to something that is way beyond our understanding sometimes. A lot of this incarceration started happening because of generational curses. I know that sounds religious. It sounds like I'm getting into a religious thing there, and it kind of is. It's generational curses. A lot of people made bad decisions, but they made bad decisions based on the things that they were taught by their fathers. My dad was incarcerated. 
My uncles have been incarcerated. My grandmother had 12 sons. All of my uncles were incarcerated. Everybody that I learned from was incarcerated. Everybody that I grew up around was incarcerated. I am one of seven of the first African-American male uh, that were charged as an adult in 1979. I got charged at the age of 15 as an adult. My first time being incarcerated, I was charged as an adult and sentenced to a life term, which as an adult in the California system means until the age of 21. So I was held until, from 15, I was held in California youth system until I turned 17. At 17, I was sent to San Quentin. San Quentin, if you don't know, is one of the worst penal systems in the world. It's, uh, I don't want to give you any gory stories. I don't want to tell war stories. But it's one of the places that, for me, at the age of 17, still in development, I thought I was grown. I thought I was in charge of things. I was selling drugs. I'd already been shot at that time. So life, this was part of the process. Unfortunately, for my way of thinking, this is how you got some of your stripes in the hood. You had to go through time. And you had to do your time as a stand-up guy. You had to do the time and not tell on nobody. You had to ride it out. You weren't going to be sexually molested. You wasn't going to do any of that thing. And when you came home, those were bragging rights. Those were how you got your stripes. So I was ready to do my time until I got to San Quentin and found out that it was a world, a subculture inside a world. It was a whole different way of thinking, acting, and feeling. You had to learn how to, I had to learn how to smother my feelings. I had to learn how to smother my thinking. My development was arrested when I went to San Quentin because I had to take off humanity and put on beast mode. I was gonna survive by any means necessary. And so I spent the next two and a half years of my life surviving. Fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, my uncles, I had a few uncles that were at San Quentin. So I already had a covering somewhat over me. But I was still involved with things that were, I wouldn't wish it on anybody else. But I say that to say that I learned and I followed in the footsteps of those that came before me. I followed in the footsteps of people that didn't have or felt like they didn't have any other option but the streets. Felt like they didn't have any other opportunities but the streets. We went from slavery to apartheid to all these different things to incarceration. And so this started a cycle in my life of in and out of the penitentiary system, in and out of the system. I've been on paper now, I'm 54 years old. I've been on paper since 1979. Fortunately now, I'm involved in a program and I'm involved in a stage where at the end of this year, I'll be released for paper for the first time in my life as an adult. So the things I'm talking to you about really do make a difference. Being involved in decarceration, being involved, this time around in the system, I just got out in January 3rd of 2018 was my first time being released after 10 years. I just walked off a 10 year bid. And it was during that incarceration that I had made up my mind I'd had enough. I'd had enough. And so a lot of the things that I was involved in, I started to put those things to the side because I felt like something had to be different. I was living at a level that was beneath myself. And I couldn't figure out for the life of me what was going on. Now for me, religion played a big part and my turning things around. You know, I, I had come to a point, my wife who was here with me this morning, I had come to a part and to a stage where I had to ask God, what's this really all about? What's really going on? You may have heard this old song, you deep in the game, but you got all the rules missing. Well, I was deeply involved in this, and I was perpetuating this stereotype that was detrimental to not only myself, but my community and everybody around me. I have nieces and nephews, I have grandsons, I have daughters that are growing up in a system that is against them, but it's against them because of what I did. It's things that I did. I came up here in 1986, 
for the first time, my uncle sent a crew up here. And what I mean by a crew is I was part of a, a, a group called the Crips. And we came up here for the first time in 1986, and there were 27 of us. So we came up here and we spread drugs and we did everything that we did in the state of Washington. Some of you are too young to remember, but it, it made a lot of news and it was all over the broadcast and it changed the culture of Washington state. We brought this gang mentality here and it just changed the environment. And at first I thought it was the thing to do. It's what we were doing. We were going and populating other areas and spreading our poison, spreading our mentality to other areas. And I thought that that was the thing to do. It's so easy to spread poison. It's so easy to spread hatred. But it's really hard, I'm finding now, to spread awareness. It's really hard to spread hope. But it's something that I feel I'm called to do. It's something I feel like I have to do. Because I've spent the majority of my life, I've spent all of my adult life in, carcer in incarceration. From two life sentences that got overturned to the last time that I did time, I was facing another life sentence. And it was at that time, by the grace of God, that a life sentence was spared me that I decided, this time, I can't do this anymore. I owe too much to my community. I owe too much to my wife and family. I owe too much to myself to keep doing this. And so that's part of the reason that I'm here today, to help spread some light and show you some of the downfalls of incarceration. Because of incarceration, I can't get a regular job. Because of having the, I call it the scarlet letter, called a felony. Because of having a felony on my record, or several, just having that title, felon, keeps me out of the job pool. It keeps me out of levels of education where I can't apply for grants and FAFSAs because of a felony record. It keeps me out of housing. It keeps me out of several different programs. And this is another form of slavery. It's another form, and, it's, and, and the funny part is, it's not just designed for black people. This time around, Lewis, who put this thing on, we did time together. When I first started in the 79, you didn't see Caucasians in the prison system. If you did, they were bikers, they were hell angels, they were guys that this is a choice, this is the life they live. But you didn't see average white Americans in the prison system. When I left this time, when I left last year, the prison system, there were more whites than blacks in the institution that I was in. And they were just spun off of incarceration. I would see families, mothers and grandmothers, come to visit their white kids, their sons, in these institutions. And they were just blown away that they were in this environment. And it wasn't about a black and white thing. I'm not talking about a black and white thing. Please don't get that misunderstood. I'm talking about incarceration becoming the animal that it's become today. Incarceration doesn't care what your color is. You just present another number. It doesn't matter what your nationality is, what your background is. If you get caught up in the system, you just feed the furnace. You're just fodder for the furnace. Incarceration keeps you out of so many things. I've not been able to get jobs in regular places. I just tried to get a job in, at Safeway just to see how it would go. And Safeway sent me back a response. We thank you for applying, but you can't work for us or any of our associates. And they gave me a list of their associates that a notification would go out to let them know if I applied, I couldn't be hired. I'm not supposed to work with the public. But by the grace of God, I was able to start something with my church. I am now the director of Life Change House. I help guys coming out of incarceration. I help guys coming out of the drug system. I help guys coming out of treatment facilities. I help guys coming out of mental facilities to have housing. I don't know if you've paid attention or if you've been looking, but homelessness is a mass problem in the United States right now. And a lot of that stems from mental illness and drug addiction. But the answer to it has been incarcerate, and when you get out, you've got nothing to go to. And so unless we get a different idea, 
unless we have a different theory, a new way of approaching this, this only grows. Here in Kent, on the way in, there's a man down here on the road with a sign asking for handouts. That is becoming a norm. It's so normal now we drive by it and we don't even pay attention to it because it's become the norm. But this all stems from incarceration. Trust me, he's had incarceration in his past. We have to change our thinking about this. We have to change the way we approach this. I'm part of Life Change Housing. We help men coming out. But I also, as a felon, I go back into treatment facilities and speak at treatment facilities. I'm in the process of going back into the prisons. If you ever told me 10 years ago that I would be voluntarily going back into prison to help other men, I'd have told you you was crazy. I would have sworn up and down something was going, you must be getting high. But it's what I do now. It's the joy of my life. It's what brings me satisfaction because we have to think different. We have to do better in order to have better. And so this is why in decarceration, this program and everything concerned with this program, please get the knowledge. Please get, get the information. As you young people coming up getting these educations, you can make the difference. You can turn things around. People of color, we can make the difference. We don't have to live this way. And that's part of what I'm trying to do is especially going back into the prisons. I want to change the mindset and the thinking of how, especially as an African-American male, I want to change the thinking of how we look at the system. It's no longer thinking, oh, the man put me here. No, bad choices put me here. But where do those bad choices come from? It comes from generational curses, generational thinking, generational arrested development. We haven't learned to think beyond our walls. We haven't learned to think outside the box. And unless one of us goes back and starts banging the drum, I feel like the Lewis and Clark. I have to show there's a new world. There's a new way. There's a new way of thinking and a new way of understanding. And that's what decarceration is all about. It's trying to help us think different about the system. Jay Inslee is very open to helping turn around recidivism. Uh, Dan Saddleberg who came out of Norm Mailey's office, is very open about changing decarceration, changing the system. They sit in positions of power, but unless we have a, a message to take to them, unless we have an answer, people are so accustomed, especially in the African-American community, we're so accustomed to banging the drum about the wrongs, but we don't have answers about how to make it right. Well, my first answer is we must educate ourselves about the wrongs, how we're thinking, how we're looking at things. Another way of thinking, jobs aren't for suckers. Excuse my French or English. Jobs aren't for squares. Jobs are for everyone. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. That hasn't changed throughout history. We have to work to earn a way. We have to work to, earn, to take care of our families. We have the largest number in the African-American community of fatherlessness. We have to stop having babies with different women all over the place. I'm getting on my bandwagon right there, but these are some of the things we have to think about going in. We have to learn to take responsibility for our actions. But in order to learn how to take responsibility for our actions, we have to figure out what responsibility really is. As I began to learn during my incarceration what responsibility it really is, I started making different decisions and choices about what I say yes to. I can't say yes to everything because there are effects. There are causes and effects. I can only say yes to things that are positive and that brings about positivity. If it's negative, I can't say yes to it. I had to put down the gang mentality. I told you earlier that I came up here with 26 guys. Out of the 26, 27 guys, I was the 27th. Out of the 27 of us, only three of us are still alive. 24 of the, my friends that I grew up with, that I ran with, died violent deaths in the streets. They didn't die from natural causes. They died violent deaths. The other two are incarcerated with life sentences. They'll never get out. So I'm the only one of the 27 that's out here with this message, with this story. 
But my two friends that are incarcerated, I keep in touch with them and they said, man, go and tell them. Go and let them know, don't come this way. This isn't for us. We can do something different. So my hope, my prayer, and my desire is to bring about change to how we think. We can change the system, but in order to change the system, we must first change ourselves. We have to change our thinking. So I get education. I reach out to DOC. It's funny because I work with DOC all the time now. I get calls from DOC, hey, we got guys that need to get out. Can you help us get them into a different place? Yeah, yeah, I can. Because that's where my mindset is today. So I thank you for letting me come and just babble a little bit, tell you the story. I represent a culture, I represent a time that is past. But I also represent a future that goes forward. So I'm just asking you to join with me. Think about it. We must change the system. Because without change, we're doomed. And this is not a doomsday message. This is a victory message. We can change the way things work. I'm 54 years old, and I'm on a path that I've never been on before. But it started with a thought to change. And with that, I'll open up for any questions. So it changed not only the culture of Washington State, but it changed the laws. And if we can change the laws to the negative, with a positive mindset, can we change it to the positive? So that's what I've been on. I came here in 86, and it's been kind of a roller coaster ride ever since. Yes. Thank you so much. DeAndre Jones was the young man that was killed two weeks ago in the South End. Uh, I am also a partner with a guy named Kevin Loyal, who is a teacher at Rainier Beach High School. DeAndre was one of our guys. We have a nonprofit called Kings Academy, where we work with at-risk youth coming out of the Central District in the South End. We try to help them get to colleges. We try to help them to finish high school. We try to help them get into the court systems. A lot of these guys already have felony records. So we're trying to prevent them from furthering that and moving in a different direction. And it's a sad thing, but he's one of the guys we lost in this battle. It's a, it's a fight that we have to continue every day, but the gang situation is really, if you look at it, it stems from fatherlessness. If I don't have a father, if I don't have, how am I supposed to learn how to be a man if there's no man to show me? 
and all I have is the big home. You know, we call it uh, the hood. But before that, it was called a neighborhood. And if you take the neighbor out of the hood, you no longer have a covering. You no longer have a covering. So our, our theme and our drive is to get the neighbor back into the neighborhood. Uh, excuse the word I'm about to use, but we don't believe in perpetuating nigger. We call them nephew. Come here, nephew. Come here, home. Just to change the thinking. If you hear something repetitively, it starts to sink in. One of the greatest things about a habit is in 30 days, if you do something repetitively, you'll grow a habit from it. So if you're constantly hearing nephew, family, if this thing is getting driven in, subconsciously it starts to take effect. It's hard to shoot somebody when you're calling them nephew, when you're calling them family, when you're calling them brother. So this is part of the drive that we're on. This thing is so much bigger. I only have a, a few minutes to share this, but you know, there's a part in the scripture that says, there's no sin that has overtaken a man except that which is common to him. And as I delve into this thing and as I look, a lot of this stuff is common. It came from common backgrounds. A lot of the guys that we work with, the young men, from ages 12 to 18, 12 to 21. They all have a common background. Fatherlessness, addiction issues, families who've been addiction, in addiction and incarceration. These are the three main components that keep the wheel going. And so we're trying to break those things with education. We're trying to break them with youth activities. We just got a grant to start a boxing program in the Rainier Beach area. So we're going to be working with youth this summer, trying to turn these things around, get them into something positive. I idle mind is the government's workshop. So we want to get their mind on other things. We're trying to raise funds now to start putting together college tours, to take some of the young men from the inner city to, who have never seen anything different but the hood. Let them go see colleges. Let them go see there is a way out, because to see it inspires hope. It was an individual thing. Uh, it's a political thing. There are applications that go out to get clemency for certain, especially during election time. Clemency petitions go out. And I have been up for a clemency petition on numerous occasions. And I finally got one and it overturned a life sentence for me. So that was the first one. And then the second one, it was just by the grace of God that judge, the original sentencing judge who swore he would give me a life sentence, got sick and couldn't make it in that day. And so another judge came in to sentence me, and he said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you another chance. And that was a wake-up call for me, because I'd been shot. I've been shot three different times. I've been in a lot of different things. I've been in drugs all my life. And a wake-up call just came, it's like, what is this all about? I have a praying wife, a praying family, and it was, it was just a wake-up call for me. Something had to be different. Something had to be different. And that just started a cycle of getting information. While I was incarcerated, I found out about Bridges to Life. I found out about all the different programs that would help me get back into society in a positive way and to make a difference. And once I started delving into those things, I saw there's a need for us to go back and say, hey, we can do better than this. So that's what the turnaround is for me. Yes, sir. So speak about, uh, you just mentioned when you're incarcerated and start learning about programs. When you're younger and you're incarcerated, <coughs> were there educational programs available then? And what are you seeing now? Because we're looking at what more can we be able to get in there to make give people a pathway once they get, get out. 
be a better trend now, or can one of the more things be doing? What, when I first started in the system in 79, there were, you could get a college degree in prison. There was academia available while incarcerated. But around the 80s, that phased out. There was not enough money, and that was one of the first things that was cut. So those things phased out of getting educated. I would have to say that in the last 10 years, in the last decade, that's starting to come back. It's starting to make a slow return back to the system, but I'm telling you, it's so necessary. It's so necessary. If guys can get, if prison is where you had to go to get in touch with education, expanding your mind and furthering your mind, then by all means necessary. But we got to get education back into the prison system because we got to wake up the thinking of the individuals who are incarcerated. And I just want to say to you, you know, I have a friend, Doug, who's still incarcerated. Doug is a Caucasian male. Doug is doing his first bid ever in life at the age, he started at the age of 36. And we were walking the yard one day, and I spoke to an old friend of mine who I'd been knowing in the system since the 80s, since I started here in Washington State. And he was walking with his son and his grandson on the big yard. And he said, is that a father and son? I said, that's a father, a son, and a grandson. And he said, are you kidding me? And I said, no. I started with him, now his son is here, and now his son's son is here. He said, man, that's crazy. I said, Doug, if you don't pay attention, if we don't wake this thing up, you'll be walking with your son, and you'll be walking with your son's son. Because that's the way this thing works. It perpetuates. It started with tough on drugs, and it manufactured crack cocaine. It started in the black community, and so they passed all these laws. But lo and behold, another drug came on the set that pushed crack out of the way called methamphetamines. It's also manufactured, and it gets you the same law, the same time that it did to black people, but now it's affecting white people. And so the numbers have grown exponentially. The prison system is blowing out of the walls. There's not enough room to house all the people that are being incarcerated. So we need deferments. We need other systems in place. At one time in the system in America, you wouldn't incarcerate. You'd never see a pregnant woman incarcerated. You'd never see it. Purdy, five years ago, asked for an expansion budget of $2.7 billion. I have all the facts in my file because I keep a lot of facts about incarceration. $2.7 billion as an expansion to open a housing facility for pregnant women. But if you've chased that back, why are they incarcerating pregnant women when they used to be deferring? You got a lot of women that get pregnant, they're out there getting high, they're running and gunning, and they end up pregnant and they're in the system. Instead of deferring them now, they send them to prisons where they are with their baby, they're allowed to live in this dorm and have their child, and if you don't have someone, a family member or someone that can come get that child within six months, you have to put the child up for an adoption. You have to adopt your child out. There's not a choice. Or the system does it for you. If you chase that back, I'm just giving you a little history. This is all factual. You can check it out for yourself. Same-sex marriage became a popular thing. They even passed a law that you could get married. Same-sex couples. Well, same-sex couples were finding it hard to adopt children in the normal system. So where were they able to get kids from? There wasn't a pool for them. Now there is. More children are adopted out of Purdy by same-sex couples than anywhere else in the world. It all runs to a system. Just follow the dollars. Just follow the dollars. Follow the dollars. These children are being adopted out to more same-sex couples than anywhere else. It's somatic. It's systematic. It just flows in a circle. But you have to be ready to sit down and open up your mind and see, where is this going? What are we doing? What are we doing? Is that it? Any other questions? Thank you, Lawrence. You were here about writing papers, about this systemic social issue problem and everything. I think, like, I kind of wanted to hear, you know, a lot of Say, what, like, people do this, you really do most, like, what's the hardest thing? 
One of the alternatives that I see, especially in, in my community, I can just mainly speak to my community, is education. Making people aware. A lot of young people are doing things because they don't have, that they feel they don't have an alternative. I have nothing else to do. But if I make you aware of your alternative, if I make you aware of your opportunities, if I show you how to get through some of these systems that have previously been closed off to you, a lot of people say it doesn't work and they've never even tried. Well, they got that because their mom said, well, it didn't work for me. So they don't even try it. But if we walk them through it, if we show them, if we're hands on, if we have enough people with a, a, a renewed mind, a renewed way of thinking to come into the colleges, to come into the jails, to come into the treatment facility and say there's another way, then it begins the marching order for a new way of thinking, a new way of going. Then we can come to the table with people like Jay Hensley, with people like Dan Saddleberg, and say, listen, we've tried this. It's working. Can you shine a light on it? And they do. They're willing to listen. I found that I came under Norm Malin when I first came to Washington State. And we used to call it the Norm Malin Law because it was a three strikes you're out law. And the three strikes you're out law says, well, if you had three of the same felonies, you could get life in prison. Well, there was a system that nobody was thinking about that said that if you came up to King County Courts and you had four, felon, four misdemeanors, it became one felony. But the thing was, hey, listen, you would go into court and there was a guy named Ir Irvin Paul who was a, a, a public defender, and he said, I'll get you out today if you just sign guilty here. I'll get you out today. And because we were ignorant and we didn't know about the big hammer on the other end, we'd sign and get out. But I'd be back next week with something else. Hey, come on up here, let me sign. And you want your name to be in one of his folders because you know he's going to get you out. He'll get you out today. But in time, those things just added up. They add it up. And then you stand in front of a judge and he said, listen, I don't know if you know it or not, but you signed off on it. You're open to an exceptional sentence. I'm going to give you life in prison. So you've got guys that are doing life in prison right now for shoplifting. Because you've had numerous shoplifts, it's the same crime, it's a crime spree, you're out. But unless we educate, unless those of us that have been set free go back and say, listen, there's some errors here. First of all, we got to get you a mindset to stay out of the system. If you're going to be involved in the system, get involved to change the system. Don't get involved to be a part of the system. So we have to bring this kind of awareness. We have to ring the bell and say, it's time to wake up. You know, I, I don't want to put you on the spot. I didn't even get your name. But when I first got here, there was some staff that walked us in. He walked me from the parking lot, and he opened the door to let me in. But the first thing I noticed is he had a gold badge on the side of his belt. And I said, okay, he's security or he's a police officer. But this is the kind of notification. Coming from the community, we all notice certain things, even if we don't speak it. Even if we don't speak it, we notice certain things. He's, the first thing he said, are you check? So he knew. We all know. But if we don't speak it, it'll never be explained. If we don't say, we can work in unison. We can work together. He opened the door and let me in.
David. But David opened the door and let me in today. That, to me, makes this all worthwhile. That, to me, says this thing works. This thing works. But I first had to get educated. So education can turn this thing around. Somebody knows, somebody in a family or close to them. And just by you coming here and opening, you know, opening the eyes, you know, because I know people, I've been in jail myself. I did time myself, like in 95, you know, I ran with gangs. And just to see people, they never th thought that they would be in prison, you know, in jail. But it goes with following people following, making the wrong decision, oh, just this once. And, and it just, you know, it, it gets bigger and bigger. And, um, it's, and I've seen it, you know, what, what it does. I and mean, you have the right, the right point of helping because, like, my, like I said, my brother did like about 11 years on that 15. And he did like two years solitary confinement. I mean, two years. He didn't touch anybody, you know, didn't, you know, he could yell, you know, two and a half years, you know, by, by himself. He's out now, but he'll never be the same. And it just goes with the smallest decision in daily life. You know, you make, oh, just this once. Oh, it's just me. Oh, it's just, you know, the minimizing, you know, that minimizing just takes somewhere, you know, you know, God forbid that nothing, you know, that. I mean, if you continue where you're going and, and don't follow that, you know, the, the cool thing to do, the speeding, the drinking, and, oh, just weed, because, you know, it unfortunately, you know, it can be on the other side. And um, I just thank you for being here, and I um, hope I made a little bit of sense. <laughs> one decision. He said it in those words, one decision. All you need to do is get one felony conviction and you're locked out. One felony conviction, you're locked out. Part of decarceration is we want to try to get government and officials to understand, given a period of time, given a period of specific conduct, given a, a period of a turnaround, can we get that scarlet letter taken off of us so we can get back active in society, so we can have voting rights? A lot of us are uh, facing the consequences and suffering the consequences of laws we can't even vote on. Deci decisions we have no say so in. Right. We need to get that right back. And so that's what part of decarceration is. That's what part of coming in and talking to you young people who are gonna make the laws, mm -hmm. who are gonna make these decisions in the future. If you can have some empathy, if you can have an understanding, some sympathy for what the system is. That's how we change it. 